Thank you, Mary Clark, for beginning um, this time together um, with those hymns. I appreciate them, especially Freely Freely. That sounds like the perfect way to think about today. Um, the choir is going to sing. Um, we're back in session now, and the choir, choir is going to sing, Jesus is the Light of the World. I would like to um, introduce the people who are here in the meeting house before we begin this morning. We have Sharon Reinard with us and Ellen Craig. We have Tony and Kay Mendenhall and Doug Baker, Cleo and Diana McFarland, Jim Wells, um, Rob and Val Pearson, Brian Lilly, Deborah Lilly. It is nice to have Deborah back. <laughs> it's been a long time. Thank you, Deborah, for joining us today. And um, Michelle Lilly, we have Dennis Engel and Nita Burton. Um, Doug and Kathy Simmons are here. Um, 
Dave Longnecker, Susan Simons, Missy Smith, and Susie Turner. We have Al Groth and Linda Groth and Norm Peters and Karen Peters and Marsha Holliger and also um, Mary Clark and Ron and I. On Zoom this morning we have um, Delmer and Dwight Ferguson from Overland Park, Kansas. Welcome, it is good to see you. We have Terry Reinert from his home here in Winchester. We have Teresa and Kenny, Teresa Wallace and Kenny Gurton from, their, from Teresa's home in um, Winchester. We have, because I saw ten, uh, Kenny's home being built, so that's good news. Um, we have Betty Locke from out at the hotel and soon to be Summers Point. That's really good news. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have Bill and Joyce Wagner from Muncie, Indiana. Welcome, Bill and Joyce. We have Lois Hogue from Sarasota, Florida. Welcome, Lois. We have Jeff Clark from his home here in Winchester. Welcome, Jeff. And Eileen Critch from her home here in Winchester. Welcome, Eileen. We have Cliff Painter from Calaveras County, where it's snowing, but not necessarily snowing, but it's cold there anyway. Thank you, Cliff, for being with us this morning. We have Pat Engel from her home here in Winchester. Welcome, Pat. And we have Stan and Gretchen Hendrickson, who are here with us from their home here in Winchester. Welcome, Stan and Gretchen. We have Kathy Burton from her home here in Winchester. Welcome, Kathy. It's good to see you this morning. We have Charlie and Valerie Boyd from Wichita, Kansas. You guys are upright and walking. That's good news for today. <laughs> we have Tony and Marcia Critch from their home here in Winchester. Welcome, Tony and Marcia. And both Sam and Rhonda, yay, from Overland Park. It's good to see you guys this morning. And we have Suzanne Weber. I know she's there. Um, she has shut off her camera, but I know she's there. So thank you, Suzanne, for being here. And Kendra Holliger, Holliger from her home in Richmond, Indiana. Um, so those are the people who are present today. And I think we're going to begin with a hymn. We just had a motorcycle drive by the church with their speaker up on full volume. So you're, you in the room here are gonna have to compete. I don't think it was in the... Oh, okay. So you're okay? <laughs> okay. The TVs are doing weird things. Just bear with us, okay? And I wanted to point out, Mary has not gone crazy on the piano. That slide thing that she did at the end of the choir piece is actually in the music. So just so you know, she's not going wild on us. She's... Ron, Ron, you might want to check the HDMI cable on the side of the computer. I think it might be loose. I can't understand. The HDMI cable on the side of the computer, I think, is loose. Okay. Oh. Got it. Yeah. Come back. Still no. nothing? Oh, there it is. All right. Our theme for the past three years or so has been Zoom wins again. Zoom just won again. But we're back. I think we can go ahead. We are going to sing a couple of songs. The first one will be number 81. And I hope that you will pay attention. The choir piece actually had a, had a line in it about Jesus paying the price for our sin. And this hymn... Number 81, um, what a wonderful savior, actually has it built right into the first line. Christ has for sin atonement made, what a wonderful savior. We are redeemed, the price is paid. What a wonderful savior. So let's stand together if you will, if you're able, and let's sing together number 81, what a wonderful savior.
seated please hang on to your him no you probably don't need it to sing this little chorus but i'm we're going to sing it anyway it's number five thirteen if i remember correctly five hundred thirteen in the hymnal oh how he loves you and me he gave his life what more could he possibly give again driving home this point there is no inflation in the kingdom of god he's already given everything he could give number five thirteen oh how he loves you and me Ron mentioned in his essay, in his reflection, about America's worst inflation, um, America's worst inflation happened in, um, occurred during and after World War I when prices soared to over 80% between 19, 19, 1916 and 1920. In thinking about that, I found a reading from Quakers in a yearly meeting in 1920, and this is the reminder that I needed um, in a world that is kind of crazy. This is how we are to live. God is like Jesus Christ, and we can rule out of our thoughts of him everything that conflicts with the character of Christ. He that hath seen me hath seen the Father, from John 14, 9. Jesus was the man of the people who knew their joys and sorrows because he lived as one of them. He learned life at the carpenter's bench in Nazareth. He knew the trouble his mother had in patching the old garment, the value of the woman's, woman's lost coin, the cost of the widow to her two mites, the difficulty of the poor women, woman in getting justice from the unjust judge. He took our common life and daily toil and made them into divine things. The crowded cities of Galilee were his home. His heart went out to the helpless and the diseased, to the oppressed poor, to the rich, starving, starved of true fellowship, and to the self-righteous separated by their hardness of heart from their fellows and from God. He gave himself to men without reserve in loving fellowship. Their life and lot came to, into his life. Those who opened their hearts to him knew his life. An overcoming love came into their lives. When his people refused him and crucified him, his love still sought them undespairingly. This is how Jesus lived and died and still lives among men and women. This is how God lives among men and women. 
And this is how we are to live among men and women. In our hearts, we know this life of unity with God and our fellows. We must then, from our hearts, live it out as God's way of life in the world. It will open our eyes to the oppression caused by the many of the economic and other privileges which we have often taken for granted. And in opening our eyes, we'll abase our hearts. It will send us forth to break down the social and educational barriers and to abolish servitude, which mar the fellowship of the human family. It will make, take us with Jesus, not only into lowly service, but also into clear-sighted truth. We shall find our lives brought alongside the lives of others in practical fellowship. We may, give, we may have to give up what the world counts as most dear, but we shall be filled with the joy of love. May that be so today. Thank you. I usually try to explain why I wrote what I wrote, at least briefly, before we enter into worship sharing. It should be fairly obvious to all of us, I think, that I wrote what I wrote primarily because everybody sitting here and everybody across this country on our Zoom screen has been fairly adversely affected by the inflation of the past couple of years ever since we began to emerge from the pandemic. Pam and I recently saw a report on television, I think probably many of you saw that as well, saying that over 60% of the United States economy is composed of individual consumerism. 60% of our entire economy is about you and I as individuals spending money and what we do with the resources that we've been given. In the work that I've done with Friends Committee on National Legislation, there is a group of guys who have studied economics quite deeply who keep insisting that that needs to change if we are going to ever be really healthy as a society, that consumerism should not be the driver of our way of life. And yet, that's what it has been. So I wrote what I wrote because I think that we should all recognize that inflation is not just a financial problem for people that don't make enough money to pay their bills. Inflation is a spiritual problem as well. And from the book of Acts, both in chapters two and four, we get an example of how the early church was led by the spirit of God to deal with similar things. If you look at um, the circumstances of the book of Acts, in those early days after Jesus ascended back to the Father, the believers in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, you know, they had some good times and they, the church grew like crazy because people were hungry for the truth that they were proclaiming. But that also then made some enemies for them and they, eventually became horribly persecuted. People wouldn't hire them. People wouldn't sell them things. They had a really difficult time of surviving financially and economically because of their witness for Christ. It is Acts chapter two and Acts chapter four that gives us a sense of what the spirit led those people to do in order to get by and in order to actually thrive in the midst of pretty harsh treatment from others. The second chapter of Acts says that those Christians devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. 
even in the midst of struggle with the powers that be, the church can thrive if they watch over one another for good in the, in the terms of those early Quakers um, from the 17th century. They watched over one another for good. They made sure that no one among them was going hungry or going without what they, what they needed for basic life. If you go on over to the fourth chapter, the same kind of thing is repeated once again. This is after some of the disciples had been arrested and mistreated in the jails because again, they had, they had gathered this opposition to themselves. And so it says there in verse 23 of chapter four, on their release, Peter and John went back to the people and reported what the chiefs, priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, the people raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through our, the mouth of your servant, our father David, and quotes a passage from the Old Testament. And so they just said, now Lord, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God together boldly. And then this is how they went about their economic lives. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own they shared everything they had. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money to the, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. When Pam looked at what I had written yesterday and started making comments, one of the first things she said was, we need to emphasize this thing of community, the power of community to help us get through times like this, where some people are really struggling to pay their bills. In, on the second page in the paragraph that is titled, Don't Make Things Worse, I bolded a sentence which begins, self-interest took precedence over the common good. That was a reference to what has happened in this inflationary spiral in, in our own country, in our own economy. I have read multiple articles now by people who are economists and who know things, who simply suggest that if in the beginning there were some things that really should have been increased in price because the supply chains were so bad that those things became very scarce. And if you really had to have those things, they were gonna be expensive. But the problem was that we do not have the common good at the heart of our treatment of one another in this country. We are a capitalist country that encourages competition and encourages everyone to get ahead just as fast as they can. And that certainly was true as we began to emerge from the pandemic, that self-interest got ahead of the common good. And so when people, especially big corporations who seem not to have a conscience, but just have the bottom line in mind, when they saw that people were adjusting to the higher prices for those things that really were scarce, they just said, raise all the prices in the store, just go around and put new price tags on everything and we'll just kind of sneak this in. Well, it wasn't very sneaky, but they certainly made it happen. As the followers of Jesus, and especially as Quakers, Quakers with a testimony of simplicity, who insist that we will live simply so that others may simply live, we need to consume no more than is necessary, so that that leaves more for others and does not create scarcity, but allows prices to remain stable rather than forcing prices up because things become in shortage. It's, you know, that's a small individual thing. I, I've told people many times, when Pam and I were country representatives for MCC in Uganda, we had a couple that 
wanted to fly home to the United States and they went to the travel bureau and were booking air tickets and they came to us with this discussion about which airline they should take and how much they were allowed to spend. And it was a matter of just convenience of connections in Europe or something. But they wanted a ticket that was almost $1,000 higher than the ticket that would have gotten them home just, just as quickly, but just less convenient connections. Well, Mennonite Central Committee had, I think, in the neighborhood of 600 people working overseas. And if we as country representatives said to that one couple, oh, you know, no worries, we'll, we'll find the money, go ahead and spend the extra thousand dollars. If all the country representatives around the world said that to their MCC volunteers, all of a sudden, Mennonite Central Committee has to come up with about 600 times 1,000 just to pay those single air trips. We always thought in those terms that our little actions as individuals have a composite. They, they actually add up to be in a whole lot of difference if we are not careful. And so that's why those early Christians in Jerusalem tried to be led by the Spirit about how they treated all the resources that God had placed under their control. We ought to be living in that same way, it strikes me anyway. So that's why I wrote what I wrote, because we're not going to be out of this inflationary thing for quite a long time. It, this is a great big ship and it doesn't steer very quickly. And so we will be dealing with this as the whole economy adjusts over years. We can have a really encouraging and effective witness to those around us if we live simply so that others can simply live. That's primarily why I wrote what I wrote. We are charged, as those early Christians were in Jerusalem, to watch over one another for good. The queries that we have put at the end of this essay this week, I ended up with one extra line. I don't know how I did that, so I added a fifth query. I just have to deal with it. Number one, why does it seem so difficult at times to choose the common good over self-interest in today's culture and world? Our culture makes it a lot easier to choose selfishness than the common good. Why is that? Number two, why is faithful, consistent stewardship of all our resources so important to an effective Christian life and witness? Number three, what do you think Jesus meant in Luke 14, by everything you have as the cost of following him? Number four, in your life or in the lives of those that you've seen, how has fully committed discipleship been less costly than living for the world? I find that to be a kind of interesting question. I hope someone will take that on. And number five, is it really possible to give everything to God and then trust him to provide all that you need? Why is that possible or why is it not possible? What do you think? We would love to hear what this subject brings to your mind. We will be um, here to help people on Mute Online and I've been replaced by the younger generation with the microphone, so Brian Lilly will be glad to bring the microphone to anyone here in the room who is, has something to share. But we do hope that you will obey the Spirit in sharing with others what may be exactly what they needed to hear today, a word of encouragement, a word of challenge, a word of praise to God. Please just be faithful. Thank you all for being here. It's so wonderful to see all these faces on the screen and all of these smiling faces here in the room. We are glad you are with us today. God bless you all.
since Ron went to the trouble to fill in the last line, I think I'll address the fifth query. And yeah, I think it also, what I wanted to say, speaks to some of the other queries also. But um, Jesus said, what you do for the least of these, you've done it to me also. I think that giving it all to God is trying to be aware of the, the things around you and the people around you who have a need and doing anything that you can or whatever you can to try to help fill that need. And uh, to give it all to God is to try to fulfill the, the commandment to love thy neighbor, to love one another. I know uh, yesterday we went to a uh, football game. Our great grandson was playing football down at Northeastern. And we, unaware of the circumstances, we got there and, and I, we don't carry a lot of cash. We usually don't carry much. And yesterday happened to be one of those days when I didn't hardly have any money on me at all. But we had to pay to get into the ball game, which was a new thing. They, they just started doing that lately. But, you know, everybody's out to get all the money they can from whatever. Anyway, there was a lady behind us that had no idea who we was, pulled out a $20 bill and wanted to pay for our entry to the ball game. And so the, the, the lady that was running this taking the money there, she said, no, no, she said, just forget, just go on in. She said, it's okay. She said, don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, little things like that make a lot of difference. And it speaks to the query of giving it all, of helping people around you. And, and like Jesus said, what you did to the least of these, you've done it for me. It's not always something that has to be a big thing, and it's not a matter of giving everything. We might, we might think about giving it all to God. As we, we're giving it to God. We give it to the church, or we give it to, to God. It's not giving it to God. It's giving it to people around us, because that's God's commandment, to love one another. Thank you. This is probably a too sweeping a statement to make, but I'll make it anyway. <laughs> the economy of man 
seems to be in a large part built on greed. The economy of God, where the whole part is built on grace. The sentence that really jumped out at me in Ron's explication of our secular economy uh, came in the paragraph, don't make things worse. And not just because it's in bold print, but he says self-interest took precedent precedence over the common good in talking about the rising of the prices after the pandemic. He goes on to say the practice quickly spread throughout the entire economy. The word economy comes from a Greek word, economia, which really means household and the management of the affairs of the household. So there is the household of our secular lives, and then there is the household of God. And I really appreciated Ron's reference earlier this morning to the Christians in the book of Acts, where they had all things in common. Common, not as in communism, but common as in community. One wonders what the world would be like if the Christian church and Christians within the church had all followed that lead up through the ages. Well, I guess I don't. Um, I guess most Christians don't. I know, thankfully, there are some who do. But when it comes to the household of God, how well do we manage its affairs? How good of stewards are we in the household of God, in the economy of God? Lord, help us to be better, more faithful stewards in your household. Amen. Thank you. scratching my head wondering where the stupid part was from jo uh, from Bill. <laughs> I must have missed it because it all seemed pretty pr profound and wise. Uh, my take on number three, what do you think Jesus meant uh, by everything you have as the cost of following him? I don't think he necessarily called us every one of us throughout all time to have to be bereft of any possession whatsoever or any resource, but was calling us uh, in that statement to be ready and willing to give up hmm. everything if we had to, if it stood in our way, if it stood between what he called us to the love and the stewardship that he called us to, then we should give it up. But it didn't necessarily mean that each one of us would have to go on the road as he did, homeless, etc. 
each of us gives in our own way, hopefully, and uh, where we can with the gifts that we can. But I think what was important in that is to not have anything standing between uh, faithful discipleship and Jesus, our teacher. And uh, with respect to number four, it's a very interesting, complex question. There are many, many layers to it. Uh, if you're fully committed, then there is, <clears throat> excuse me, actually there is nothing that is standing between you and your discipleship. Uh, whereas if you're not fully committed, you have other interests that are filtering in that uh, are compromising your discipleship. So fully committed discipleship costs less because you don't have to compromise as much. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just talking, well, no, it's talking on two different levels, both economically and spiritually with your with your service. Um, people who live for the world are tossed and turned and thrown about by trends and fads and expectations of others. But those that are just fully committed to uh, faithful discipleship uh, to Christ, they're not tossed about by those things. They live a much more stable uh, life, both economically and um, practically. So anyways, those are just a couple of things I wanted to add. And uh, thank you, Bill, for your, your comment. Thank you. Thank you, Cliff.
I think that uh, something that happens here uh, when what Ron wrote was about the fact that uh, it seems to be the material possessions and what we do in comparing and contrasting here in the USA with everybody else around us. It shows compare and contrast and we feel in our hearts that uh, it it's giving of our material possessions and those things. And I think back about, I read years ago, uh, Mary got me the book by uh, Melody Green, which was about Keith Green's life mm -hmm. called No Compromise. And if you get a chance, read that book. Uh, it's a tremendous book about his life and what he did. But in that book, he talked about where he went to Africa and he went into an area where there was a tent and inside that tent of a dirt floor was a man sitting with the biggest smile on the ground with the radiating the love of God. You could just see it like a radiator from a heater, he said. And the man had nothing. He had no material possessions. He had a dirt floor. And I think, to, in my opinion, that's what we need to get to a point where that love of God is radiated to the point where other people are drawn in to that. And that's giving of your entire self. But somehow we get that confused with, oh, I need to give all my possessions and give all these things. And really, it's the soul and the heart that he really desires all, all from each. Yeah. Thank you. We are at about five minutes to the top of the hour. We'll wait a couple of more minutes. If you are being led to speak, we shall really hope that you will do so. Obey the spirit. Let's just continue in waiting worship for a couple more minutes. Give anyone an opportunity that should.
most of you have heard me, particularly both Pam and me, talk about the importance of our friend Stan Thornburg to our spiritual development so long ago out in western Kansas in the middle of nowhere. Stan came to Plains, Kansas as a youth pastor and then eventually became the lead pastor there when the pastor moved on. And we got to know him and began to meet with him and learn from him on a regular basis for most of six years. One of the most remarkable lessons that Stan ever taught us, he loved cars, he loved muscle cars in particular, and he really loved Ford Mustangs. Stan had a beat up old 60, Five, I think, 65 or 66 Mustang that, you know, had primer on some of the fenders where they'd been repaired. He'd gotten it from somebody that probably wrecked it. And he was working slowly at getting the thing um, put back into shape. And he'd put quite a bit of money and quite a bit of effort into that. And then he told us one day that he didn't have his Mustang anymore. He had given it to a high school kid in their church who needed a car and didn't have one. And this Mustang looked pretty rough, but it ran. Stan did that as an example of what we're talking about today. He did that because when Stan knew that God had done an absolute miracle in his life to forgive him for the things that he had been involved in before he really became a disciple and he knew that God was fully in charge of his life and that, and Stan was the one that emphasized this so much to Pam and me, no matter what we think is ours, it belongs to God. It's the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, 7 asking the searing question, what do you have that you did not receive? And if you received it, how come you're so stinking proud about it? Because you just received it as a gift. Stan taught us that lesson over and over and over again, but this gift of this car, which today would be really valuable as a collector's item, he gave that to that kid, in part because the kid needed a car. But I think the larger reason, looking back on it now, the larger reason was that Stan knew that car was gonna get in his way of being obedient to God and able to obey and move freely in his life with the Lord. So it's exactly what has been said here by many of you wise folks today, that God knows how easily distracted we are, I wrote this in that last paragraph, by the things of the world. And it's better to make the decision once and for all, this belongs to God, and it is his to do with as he chooses to do, my responsibility is to obey God's use for all things. Stan did that, in, and he didn't call attention to it. He didn't tell us about that for a long time. He just did it in obedience because he knew he had to, because it was God's car and not his. If we could just come to that place in all our lives where we realize that the blessings God has placed under our control are still God's blessings, and the Spirit needs to prompt us and lead us as to how those things are to be treated. We would all live more joyfully because we wouldn't keep making that decision over and over and over again about who's this belong to and who's in charge of this. We've already decided it simplifies your life and it gives you joy because then you can distribute God's things as God sees fit. To close today, Mary played this as part of her prelude. I'm gonna ask if we could sing a song, number 210 in the hymnal, Jesus paid it all. He made that decision once for all to pay for our sins. We give him thanks together in worship. Number 210, Jesus paid it all.
Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for your choice of music today as well. Before we go, we'd like to make sure that friends are aware of what will be happening around here this week and also aware of some prayer concerns. Tomorrow, the 26th of August, we'll be ministry and oversight at 7 o'clock by Zoom, or you are welcome to join Pam and me at the Parsonage. That'll be tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock, ministry and oversight. On Wednesday this week, as the last Wednesday of the month, it will be Bread for the World and Fast Once a Month Day. It'll also be Intercession Salad Supper to break our fast at 5.30 p.m. over at the Parsonage. And that will be followed by the Welcome Class Bible Study at 7 o'clock by Zoom. And the Fabulous Friends and Parsonage Classes every other week check in at 8.15 by Zoom. The Welcome Class Bible Study on Wednesday evening will be looking at lesson number nine in the quarterly. It's called Nebuchadnezzar's Dream, and it's drawn from the second chapter of the book of Daniel. So if you'd like to be studying ahead, you are most welcome to do that. Let us know if you need a quarterly in the Zoom link. We'll make sure that you get that in time for the class. That's all on Wednesday evening. On Thursday, the 29th of August, the choir will practice downstairs at 6.30 p.m. in the choir room in the annex basement. We would welcome any and all who would come and sing with us to come and join us you will be blessed simply by the ministry of those songs that we sing and by the friendship of the friends who gather. Please come and join us if you'd like to be part of the choir. Next Sunday, the 1st of September, we will back, be back here at 10 o'clock for worship sharing in the same manner. We hope that you will join us and hope that you'll bring a friend. It's a holiday weekend, so please don't run away. Come to meeting, then you can run away for Monday because Monday the 2nd of September is Labor Day. The church office will be closed that day. And we also would remind you that the 4th of September, the first Wednesday of that month, will be the monthly meeting for business at seven o'clock by Zoom. Please take note of all of those things. Um, there is an offering plate over on the table at the parlor entrance for receiving contributions for the ministries of Winchester Friends we once again express our deep gratitude to everyone who has so faithfully supported the church's work for so very long in this new, interesting way. The book discussion group had a good discussion of our last book this past week, and they've now chosen another book. It's called Sandwich. Uh, it may be recipes for how to make sandwiches in there. I'm not really sure what's in there. I haven't seen the book yet, but it's called Sandwich. It's by the novelist Catherine Newman. And I think there are two copies on the table over there already available for loan from the church. So you are most welcome to borrow one of those if you would like to be part of the book discussion group. Okay, on the prayer concern side of the sheet, 
I did not see Keith Kendall get on this morning. I was kind of hoping he would. We saw him on Friday and in the afternoon, and he was like a new person from the guy that we saw after his surgery on Tuesday. Um, there was real concern on, um, it must have been Thursday afternoon and evening and Friday morning. His doctors told him that they believed that he may have had a second stroke after the carotid artery surgery. They, they saw things on the scans that made them think that another CVA had, had taken place. Whatever it was, <laughs> um, Keith and Tanya also agreed that the prayers made a difference because when we got there on Friday afternoon, Keith was being moved out of the surgery recovery uh, floor and they moved him first to fourth floor and then they moved him back down to third floor and each one of those changes meant that they were less concerned about him than they'd been before. He just turned the corner on Thursday evening evidently or Friday morning and he was talkative and happy and making perfect sense. They are getting him up and walking him. He will be there the third floor final place that he came to rest um, is the therapy part of the hospital and so they are going to be doing physical therapy to get him back into good shape so that he can go back to Friends Fellowship. So please today give thanks to the Lord that he brought Keith Kendall through that surgery and through whatever happened later in the week and seems to be doing really, really well. He's probably, I don't think they would say he's out of the woods, but he's making real progress. So please pray for Keith and give thanks to God. Megan Kirkpatrick, we've not heard anything new, but I'm assuming that what I've typed here is correct, that she's in a rehab facility in Indianapolis, receiving physical therapy and other kinds of therapy to get her ready to go home one of these days. She still has a long way to go, but every day is a new day of progress. Anything you guys want to add? Brian, have you got the microphone? Let's give it to Karen. People at home want to know. Uh, Tuesday, she had a spell with her heart, and they had to take her out of uh, the rehab and take her back and did an EKG and checked her. And, and uh, so they're starting her back in on therapy again. But their whole goal is just get her so that she can somewhat help take care of herself when she goes home to finish healing and rehab. But her spirits are good, and uh, God's been with her the whole time. Good. Thank you, Karen. That's one of those ones that we will be praying for for quite some time, but we get to watch God at work, and that is a great, great privilege. Um, Valerie and Charlie Boyd are with us this morning from Wichita, and her father, Dana Hoffman, she told us at some point this past week, like, the days all kind of blur together, um, he was moved from the hospital to a rehab facility now after having an intracranial bleed. So that's really wonderful news as well and a sign of progress unless things have changed. I don't know if Valerie will want to unmute and update us or not. It's not required, Valerie. <laughs> go, go ahead if you have anything. Nothing new. He's just improving, doing great. Good. We will give thanks to God for that as well. I'm so glad to hear that he's doing better. So pray for Keith Kendall and Megan Kirkpatrick and Dana Hoffman all up there at the top of our page. Then there's a new item on the cancer list. You'll note that Mary and Jeff Clark would appreciate friends' prayers as Jeff be starts preparing to consult with his doctors about changes in his cancer counts. It is a stressful, um, a stressful thing to have to go through. I think he has to wait until the second week of September for that appointment. So please be praying for Mary's and Jeff's peace as they await that appointment and for wisdom for them and for Jeff's doctors as they make decisions about what what will come next. Pray also for others who are dealing with cancer, including Marvin McFarland, Cheryl Thomas, um, that's the growth's daughter in South Carolina, 
Carolyn Dwiggins, who is Doug Baker's friend in South Carolina. Leanne Kennedy is the Edmonds' niece over in Muncie. And Trudy Wells, a friend of the McFarlands, and Dusty Ackman, a relative of the McFarlands, all dealing with cancer in one way or another. Pray for them, pray for their families, pray for their medical caregivers, whenever you think of them. Please also be praying for the people in the medical industry and for all the patients who are now contracting this latest variant of COVID-19. The surge is real and we hope that everyone will be planning to get your vaccine when those are released in about a week. Um, just do what we can to take care of one another and show concern and kindness to one another. So pray for that situation. Pray also for Betty Monks and Betty Locke, who's been with us this morning from the motel. They have been told that they will be allowed to move back over to Summers Point sometime in early September. So they are getting ready. And I think when we, when we talk to them, sounds like they really are ready. So pray for them. This will be a, a serious transition for them. They've been at the motel for a very long time. So pray that that will all go smoothly and work out for everyone's benefit. Please remember to pray for people around the country and around the world who are dealing with all of the natural disasters that seem to come at us every day on the news. Today it's Hawaii that is in the bullseye of what has been upgraded to a hurricane now. So pray for people there and so many people in so many other places. Cliff out there in California freezing to death today, shoveling snow and the whole deal in August, no less. But pray for those around this country. The flooding that was on last evening's news was just heartbreaking. And, you know, lives being washed away by this deluge of, of flood water. So please pray for those folks when you see all of those reports. We remind you again to pray with others in Friends United meeting every day at 12 o'clock for peace and civility in this year's election campaigns and in the election itself in November. Just ask God to infuse our culture with kindness and understanding in what is a very contentious environment. And pray also for peace in the world. The situation in Palestine and Ukraine gets most of the attention and it is certainly of huge concern. The outbreak of new violence between um, the guys up in Lebanon and Israel in the last day or so has been very concerning. Please pray that the Lord will find a way to tamp that down and to help cooler heads to prevail. Pray for people who are in danger there. Pray for our friends at Ramallah Friends School who are right in the middle of all that's taking place there. Ask the Lord to be with our friends there and to protect them. Those are the things that we were aware of as we put this together. You have other concerns that should be added before we close. You're Ron, in. Ron, I hate to be such a pit bull on this, but is there any chance we can get your name put on that list? No, my pen ran out of ink. I'm sorry. <laughs> we love you, Ron. We, we, we're concerned. I appreciate it, Cliff. I really do appreciate everyone's concern. What I am in process of figuring this out, but what I need is, will be a, an elective procedure and those are not a high priority and I'm, I'm not worried. The Lord has taken really good care of me. So that will happen. We have a very complicated life and schedule and we're just trying to work this in at a time when it will not disrupt our lives too much and the lives of the people around us who have to step in and cover for me so but we are working on that and we'll figure it out before very long thank you cliff anything else fine yes terry i'd really like to thank the meeting for their continued prayers for sharon and her heart valve situation the urgency has been downgraded quite a bit um there's still a concern but the uh I can't remember the correct terminology for this doctor, but he said it's still important and they're still watching it, but the urgency is way down now. They're not near as critical as what we thought it might have been. So I thank the Lord and I thank the meeting for praying to that extent. Thank you, Terry. 
we'll give God credit for that, that this level of concern could be lowered. So, but we're not going to stop praying for Sharon. Oh, and please we, no. we will continue praying for you both. Anything else? I don't see anything lighting up and no arms are waving. Would you pause with me for a moment as we lift these things to the Lord? Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your presence with us today in worship. It is truly why we have gathered to thank you for watching over us in this turbulent time in our country and in our culture. We come to you in worship to ask for your favor, that you would help us and equip us to be your witnesses in that turbulent culture, that we could be faithful that we could be good examples of your life to those who are watching us all the time. We thank you so much for the privilege of being your children, of walking with you and of knowing the peace that comes when we truly have surrendered everything to you and can fully trust you to care for us. You have shown us by your example how you watch over us for good. We ask that you would help us to be the kind of people who do that for one another as well. We thank you for the good examples of that that we have heard about and seen even this morning. We just ask that you will continue to help us to do better at that all the time. Please do be with these who need your, your very close help today. Be with those who are struggling be with those who are in sorrow. Be with those who are in pain. Be with those who are in fear. Be for them whatever it is they need to know that you are with them and that you are in charge. Once again, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being together today. We commit these friends and loved ones into your care and ask that you will do what you know is best for each and every one of them in your time. Bless us through the remainder of this day and in the week ahead that you will help us to be sensitive to opportunities for ministry and faithful to carry them out as your spirit leads us. We love you. We worship you. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's love? Yes, it can be. Go in the assurance of that. Thank you so much, Mary. God bless you all. Go in peace and have a wonderful day and week. You are at liberty.